with less expensive furniture, less company, less costly clothing, fewer servants, a less number of balls, parties, theater goings, carriage ridings, pleasure excursions, cigar smokings, liquor drinkings, and other extravagances. But, after all, if they will try the plan of laying by a nest egg, or in other words, a small sum of money, at interest or judiciously invested in land, they will be surprised at the pleasure to be derived from constantly adding to their little pile, as well as from all the economical habits which are engendered by this course. The old suit of clothes and the old bonnet and dress will answer for another season. Their croton or spring water tastes better than champagne. A cold bath and a brisk walk will prove more exhilarating than a ride in the finest coach. A social chat, an evening's reading in the family circle, or an hour's play of hunt the slipper and blind man's buff will be far more pleasant than a fifty or five hundred dollar party when the reflection on the difference in cost is indulged in by those who begin to know the pleasures of saving. Thousands of men are kept poor, and tens of thousands are made so after they have acquired quite sufficient to support them well through life. In consequence of laying their plans of living on too broad a platform, some families expend $20,000. Some families expend $20,000 per annum and some much more, and would scarcely know how to live on less, while others secure more solid enjoyment frequently on a twentieth part of that amount. Prosperity is a more severe ordeal than adversity, especially sudden prosperity. Easy come, easy go is an old and true proverb. A spirit of pride and vanity, when permitted to have full sway, is the undying cankerworm which gnaws the very vitals of a man's worldly possessions. Let them be small or great, hundreds or millions. Many persons, as they begin to prosper, immediately expand their ideas and commence expending for luxuries, until in a short time their expenses swallow up their income, and they become ruined in the ridiculous attempts to keep up appearances and make a sensation. I know a gentleman of fortune who says that when he first began to prosper, his wife would have a new and elegant sofa. That sofa, he says, cost me $30,000. When the sofa reached the house, it was found necessary to get chairs to match, then sideboards, carpets, and tables to correspond with them, and so on through the entire stock of furniture when at last it was found that the house itself was quite too small and old-fashioned for the furniture, and a new one was built to correspond with the new purchases. Thus, added my friend, summing up an outlay of $30,000 caused by that single sofa and saddling on me in the shape of servants, equipage, and the necessary expenses attendant upon keeping up a fine establishment, a yearly outlay of $11,000, and a target pinch at that, whereas ten years ago we live with much more real comfort because with much less care on as many hundreds. The truth is, he continued, that sofa would have brought me to inevitable bankruptcy had not a most unexampled title to prosperity kept me above it, and had I not checked the natural desire to cut a dash. The foundation of success in life is good health. That is a substratum fortune. It is also the basis of happiness. A person cannot accumulate a fortune very well when he is sick. He has no ambition, no incentive, no force. Of course, there are those who have bad health and cannot help it. You cannot expect that such persons can accumulate wealth, but there are a great many in poor health who need not be so. If then sound health is the foundation of success and happiness in life, how important is it that we should study the laws of health which is but another expression for the laws of nature. The nearer we keep to the laws of nature, the nearer we are to good health. And yet how many persons there are who pay no attention to natural laws, but absolutely transgress them, even against their own natural inclination. We ought to know that the sin of ignorance is never winked at in regard to the violation of nature's laws. Their infraction always brings the penalty. A child may thrust its finger into the flames without knowing it will burn, and so suffers repentance, even will not stop the smart. Many of our ancestors knew very little about the principle of ventilation. 
They did not know much about oxygen, whatever other gin they might have been acquainted with, and consequently they built their houses with little seven-by-nine feet bedrooms, and these good old pious Puritans would lock themselves up in one of these cells, say their prayers, and go to bed. In the morning they would devoutly return thanks for the preservation of their lives. During the night, and nobody had better reason to be thankful, probably some big crack in the window or in the door let in a little fresh air and thus save them. Many persons knowingly violate the laws of nature against their better impulses for the sake of fashion. For instance, there's one thing that nothing living except a vile worm ever naturally loved, and that is tobacco. Yet how many persons there are who deliberately train in a natural appetite and overcome this implanted aversion for tobacco to such a degree that they get to love it. They have got hold of a poisonous, filthy weed, or rather that takes a firm hold of them. Here are married men who run about spitting tobacco juice on the carpet and floors, and sometimes even upon their wives' bedsides. They do not kick their wives out of doors like drunken men, but their wives, I have no doubt, often wish they were outside of the house. Another perilous feature is that this artificial appetite, like jealousy, grows by what it feeds on. When you love that which is unnatural, a stronger appetite is created for the hurtful thing than the natural desire for what is harmless. There is an old proverb which says that habit is second nature, but an artificial habit is stronger than nature. Take, for instance, an old tobacco chewer. His love for the quid is stronger than his love for any particular kind of food. He can give up roast beef easier than give up the weed. Young lads regret that they are not men. They would like to go to bed boys and wake up men. And to accomplish this, they copy the bad habits of their seniors. Little Tommy and Johnny see their fathers or uncles smoke a pipe, and they say, If I could only do that, I would be a man too. Uncle John has gone out and left his pipe of tobacco. Let us try it. They take a match and light it, and then puff away. We will learn to smoke. Do you like it, Johnny? That lad dolefully replies, Not very much. It tastes bitter. By and by he grows pale, but he persists, and he soon offers up a sacrifice on the altar of fashion. But the boys stick to it and persevere, until at last they conquer their natural appetites and become the victims of acquired tastes. I speak by the book, for I've noticed its effects on myself, having gone so far as to smoke ten or fifteen cigars a day, although I have not used the weed during the last fourteen years, and never shall again. The more a man smokes, the more he craves smoking. The last cigar smoke simply excites the desire for another, and so on, incessantly. Take the tobacco chewer. In the morning, when he gets up, he puts a quid in his mouth and keeps it there all day, never taking it out except to exchange it for a fresh one, or when he is going to eat. Oh, yes, at intervals during the day and evening. Many a chewer takes out the quid and holds it in his hand long enough to take a drink and then pop it goes back again. This simply proves that the appetite for rum is even stronger than that for tobacco. When the tobacco chewer goes to your country seat and you show him your grapery and fruit house and the beauties of your garden, when you offer him some fresh ripe fruit and say, My friend, I have got here the most delicious apples and pears and peaches and apricots. I have imported them from Spain, France, and Italy. Just see those luscious grapes. There is nothing more delicious nor more healthy than ripe fruit, so help yourself. I want to see you delight yourself with these things. He will roll the dear quid under his tongue and answer, No, I thank you. I have got tobacco in my mouth. His palate has become narcotized by the noxious weed, and he is lost in a great measure, the delicate and inviolable taste for fruits. This shows what expensive, useless, and injurious habits men will get into. I speak from experience. I have smoked until I trembled like an aspen leaf. The blood rushed to my head, and I had a palpitation of the heart, which I thought was heart disease, till I was almost killed with fright. When I consulted my physician, he said, Break off tobacco using... I was not only injuring my health and spending a great deal of money, but I was setting a bad example. I obeyed his counsel. No young men in the world ever looked so beautiful.